All right, so welcome back. Um, so here's another video that's really, ah, oh, this video is so amazing. It's one of these really awesome TED Talks. Super recommend that you watch it. Um, it's, so we talked a little bit about brain disorders in the, in the last lecture, and they're, right, we talked about that cop crowd delusion, the Cotard delusion, the Goalie syndrome, you know, these really wild stuff that happens when um, brain circuitry kind of goes wrong. Um, in this video, he talks about what happens when different brain regions aren't firing correctly. So he'll talk about Parkinson's disease and, and different um, other kind of uh, motor diseases that result from damage to the brain, basically. And by inserting implants, how you can actually control that. So super awesome video. I mean, very dramatic results. So again, highly recommend that you guys watch this. Um, if nothing else, I mean, you're going to be wowed by what's out there and what's possible, all by regulating the neurons in the brain it has dramatic effects on movement and motion. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about memory. Now, memory is a huge topic in neuroscience, so we're not going to cover the extent of it by any means. That's an entire course all by itself. But I just kind of want to give you some ideas um, about basically how memory works. All right. All right, I'm going to hide me here. I want you guys to take a second, take a look at this image, and try to tell me which one is the correct penny. We've all seen pennies, right? I mean, they're like buckshot in our pocket. If I mean, you're, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't confuse a penny for a quarter for a nickel. You know what one looks like, right? But this isn't that easy, is it? It's kind of tough to figure out which one the right penny is. It's I, by the way. Why was that so difficult? Right? And when you really think about it, it's a penny. That's like the easiest thing in the world. But to learn the specifics, hmm. We have three different processes in memory. So we'll talk about why that was so important. We have what's known as encoding, so putting it in to our brains, right? Storing it, and then being able to recall this information. Let's try to get the slide to advance. All right. So encoding to get that information into our brains requires attention. So how much really, how much attention have you really paid to the appearance of a penny? Like, do you really care? You know it's the brown one, right? It's the only coin in our currency that has that color, has that size. So you, you know what a penny looks like. You don't have to pay attention to exactly which way Lincoln is facing or where the date is or, you know, what the words are. You know, you just know, you take for granted what that penny looks like. So being, paying attention is going to be super important in your learning and in your memory, right? This is what teachers always are always going on about like, when they're asking you to pay attention in class because they know that if you're not paying attention, you're going to have a hard time remembering things, okay? So let's just think about this. I mean, let's say, and you've probably had a class where you've had to give a presentation, right? So, I don't know, let's say there's 10 other students giving a presentation. You're somewhere, I don't know, fourth in line, for example. Do you really remember anything about the presentation that the person in front of you gave? Probably not, because you're really not paying attention to what they're saying. You're probably nervous, right, and rehearsing what you're going to have to say. So as far as those other three people, especially that person in front of you, what did they talk about? You're like, oh, I wasn't paying attention. I, was, I care about me. Okay. But again, if you don't pay attention, you can't get that into memory. So it's, it's going to be really important. Um, we've probably all have had this. Right? You're introduced to someone, especially at a party, right? Hey, this is my friend Bob. And you're like, hey, how's it going? Da, 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 da. And then like two seconds later, you're like, shoot, what was this guy's name? <laughs> Don't remember at all, right? Probably because you didn't pay that close attention. You didn't really bother to commit that to memory. It wasn't important. Maybe if you meet them a second or third time, you're like, okay, I'm going to remember this person's name because clearly there's someone that's going to show up in my life, you know, over and over again, so I should know who they are, right? So again, key thing is that to get information into memory, we have to pay attention. The other part then is, right, we've paid attention, but now we've got to store this. So you probably have all heard of the term short-term memory. So 
unrehearsed information. So if you've heard something, this stays in your memory for about 20 seconds or so. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and indefinitely, if you keep rehearsing it. We may have all had this experience where you have to, like, I don't know, remember a number or something, or remember something for some period of time, you know, until you get to, I don't know, your phone, although this is getting less frequent with us carrying our phones everywhere with us, right? Unless so you have to remember a number, you have to, you, you'll repeat that over and over and over again until you use it, right? And then you forget it. So basically, short-term memory can be indefinite as long as you keep rehearsing it. Now, I want you guys to take time, you can even stop this video if you like, uh, and watch, log on and watch this video, okay? Uh, it's about this individual, H.M. His name is Henry Molaison. He basically had his hippocampus removed, okay, because he was, ha he was having seizures, um, and this is back in the 50s. So watch this video, it talks more about the procedure and exactly what happened to him. But the end result was, was that um, he, he basically had no short, he had no long-term memory. He literally had a 20-second memory. So you can walk into a room, carry on an hour-long conversation with him, and he'd be fine. Like his, his actual, what we'll call working memory, we'll see that term in a second. So his, his ability to, to, to talk and to think was fine. But as soon as you left the room and you came back, it's like you've never met him. It's like you've never had that conversation before. No sh you couldn't get that, sh that information from short-term memory into long-term memory. Literally had 20-second memory, right? Um, we, scientists, and a lot of what we know about memory today is due to um, psychologists uh, and neuroscientists studying him and his behavior and how, how his memory, um, you know, af affected his day-to-day, -day, I guess, abilities, right? Again, please watch that video. Um, it, it tells you a lot about him. It tells you a lot about what we know about memory as well. Okay. Um, so again, short-term memory, unrehearsed, you, you can keep something in memory for about 20 seconds or so. Okay. So I give you the example of a phone, although again, most of us are near our phones these days, but back in the day, um, you know, pay phones and stuff like that, you had to kind of try to memorize seven digits. Sometimes you'd be like, all right, you memorize the last four, I'm going to memorize the first three. And then you and your friend would go and call for pizza or whatever it was, right? We can increase the ability of short-term memory by using chunks. So we'll try to remember this. All right? Can you write that down? Don't look. Don't look. Can you remember that? Hard? What if I gave it to you like this? easier. Same exact letters. I just now chunk them differently. So think about this. Before, let's kind of go back, this was, this looked totally random, right? FBI, NBC, CIA, IBM. When I chunk them like this, now instead of being a whole bunch of different random letters, it's really just four things. Four things are pretty easy to remember, right? So what I would say to you as you're studying for this last um, exam, and perhaps I should mention this to you guys at the very beginning of the semester, one of the ways that you can help improve your studying is if you actually chunk things into groups. So again, they're not so many. Really, they're, they're all related to one another. Okay. And then we have this idea of what's known as working memory. And, and this concept is really uh, related to short-term memory as well. So basically what re uh, working memory is, is sort of like, like in HM when I was telling you, like he had no short-term memory. He couldn't remember that he talked to you if you walked out of the room and came back. However, while you were talking to him, he had this working memory. That's basically um, your ability um, to process uh, you know, information as far as you comprehending language, answering questions, stuff like that. So your basic day-to-day -day tasks. So if I asked you, I don't know, so you're taking notes, listening to the lecture, but now if someone asks you something else, you're like, look, don't bother me. I'm, my, you're using all of your working memory. You're trying to listen, you're trying to take notes, um, and if you add one more thing onto it, it 
goes past your working memory, your, your ability to juggle all of these things. Does that make sense? Um, so again, and that's a, that's a finite amount of working memory that we all have. Right? At some point, if you keep adding too many things that you're trying to do all at one time, you won't be able to do them all. So then from short-term memory, you want to try to get things into long-term memory. And really, when we're talking about long-term memory, what we're talking about is making, remember that heavy and plasticity that we talked about? It's basically making those physical connections between neurons so that when you want to recall something, that information is there. Not just today, not just tomorrow, but in a week's time, in a month's time, right? I mean, think about things that you want, like in long-term memory. Let's, let's talk about practical things. A lot of you guys are going into a nursing program. So let's say you, you, know, you get CPR training. So that happens in usually one day kind of thing over a couple of hours. Well, you want that in long-term memory, right? Because you might not use it tomorrow, but you might need to use CPR three months from now, right? So you want to make sure that you can get that from short-term memory into long-term memory so you don't forget exactly what you're supposed to do. And usually long-term memory is going to take repetition, repetition, repetition. Because as we learned with heavy and plasticity, right, the more that neurons fire together, the stronger they will wire together. And the stronger their wiring is, the better, um, your, better your chances are that this information will be stored in long-term memory. So really, there's a lot of times there's no real good way around simply practice, 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 practice. Bring up that information and practice it. Okay? And long-term memory, though, even though you remember it, it is not necessarily perfect. Okay, People, there, A lot of our memory is going to have an overlay of our perceptions of how we see things. Okay, um, So, you know, I don't know, you and another individual might be in the same class, even this class, and one of your long-term memories, if someone asks you a year from now, hey, how was that class? You're like, oh, it was the best class ever. She was so cool. Right? Or I, Someone else would be like, no, no, horrible, oh, worst teacher ever. You know, so long-term memory, she did all these things. And it's like, well, she never did that. And you're like, no, I totally remember it that way. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll put an emotional overlay or we'll use our preconceived sort of structures that we already have, and we'll put that on top of what the actual memory is. And they may, may not have existed. Um, so this is actually a problem um, and, and, and we forget things, in all honesty. Um, so this is actually a problem in things like, excuse me, in eyewitness accounts, for example, in crime scenes. Um, people, are, people can be very uh, sincere about what they think they remember. They're not trying to lie. Um, but when they're being asked certain things, the information they're providing is not accurate. So when ins inspectors, detectives go back to that scene, they try to recreate uh, the situation based on what the witnesses say, they're like, oh yeah, this could never have happened. Like, um, based on what they said, there's no way they could ever have seen that because there's a giant tree in the way. How did they miss that? Right? Again, long-term memory is not necessarily perfect. And we do overlay it with our, sort of our biases and our preconceived notions about stuff. Okay. Okay. Hide me here. So where do we store our memories? Basically everywhere. It's not really like we have one specific part of the brain. Um, obviously, we have different parts of the brain that are responsible for different things. Like we saw, like the fusiform gyrus is important, facial recognition. However, when we talk about memories, really they're going to be scattered throughout your brain. So things like the hippocampus, right? As you as you saw in the video with HM, right? He had his hip, he had basically his hippocampus removed, so he couldn't go from short term memory to long term memory. The amygdala is going to be really important in putting an emotional response to memory. Um, our cortex is going to be really important in memory, right? So our prefrontal cortex is going to be uh, important in a lot of our conscious information memory. Right? But really, it's scattered throughout. It's not in one specific brain region. Um, and I think we all know that, too. You probably have all tried doing this, like, all right, I'm trying to remember, I don't know, somebody's name, let's say. And you're like, oh, my God, I know I know this person's name. Let's see, they were in blah, blah, blah movie, right? And so you're trying to remember it that way. Remember, they were in da-da-da movie, and you're like, yeah, you're not remembering it. Okay, what about, they were also in this other movie, and then they were on this TV show, and they were 
on the internet because of this. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to activate different circuits, right? You're trying to get at the same information from different angles. So you, you kind of intuitively know that your memories are stored all over the place. And the more sort of connections you can make to that, the better, you, better the chances are that you'll remember it. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, So part of this is going to be also your retrieval. Now, again, as I mentioned to you before, long-term memory is not going to be perfect, and neither is retrieval. So when we're asked to remember things, you know, sometimes we don't remember it correctly. And this can be true for things that just happened to things that have, you know, that, that can be yeah, something from short-term memory, something that just happened, like just right that car accident that happened right then and there, to something that happened, you know, quite some time in the past. Now, something else I'd like to talk to you about retrieval. You have to practice that as well, okay? So I think one of the things that we're very good at as students is we, we spend a lot of time encoding things, right? Trying to get things into memory, right? But one of the things that we're not always so good at is trying to get them back out of memory, right? So you might spend a lot of time on flashcards and information into the brain, but you're not spending so much time practicing writing it out or saying it to somebody or explaining it. And all that is practicing that information, getting it out. And really, when you're asked to perform on an exam or a practical, or when you get into nursing or dental or whatever the program is that you're, get, you're going for, you're going to be asked to perform something. You're really being judged on your output. Um, so it's really important to, again, to practice the retrieval aspect. The more you practice the retrieval, the better you'll get at it. So when you get into a test, you don't blank. You, you know that. Um, so the classic example I give people is, um, you know, a lot of times what ends up having it's an exam, you're like, oh, I know this word, I studied it last night, I remember the page in my notebook that it's on, I remember the doodle in the corner of that page, but you can't remember the actual, you know, bit of information. That's because you've worked really hard on putting that in, you haven't worked so hard at getting it back out. So again, practice, practice, practice retrieval. That's again why it's so important that we try to explain it to, you know, our child, our dog, an inanimate object, to nobody in particular in the room. Okay, because that's all that is practicing retrieval. And in practicing retrieval, you'll also get an idea of whether or not you actually understand the information as well. Okay, and hopefully that'll also make you make more connections with the information. And again, the more connections you make, the more different pathways you can use try to get at that information. All right, kind of hide me here, last couple of slides. Um, as I mentioned, we have that uh, longitudinal fissure that's going to split our, our cerebral hemisphere into left and right halves. Um, and really, this hemispheric lateralization, there is some degree of it, but it's not as great as it once thought. Really, there's quite a bit of more of integration going on between the two hemispheres than there is segregation. Okay. Um, however, some things we know to be true. So muscles, uh, I'm sorry. So the left hemisphere is going to control muscles on the right side of the body. Okay. Um, spoken written language is predominant. Those centers, so Wernicke's and Broca's area, are, are larger on the left side than they are on the right side. So certain brain nuclei will be bigger on one side than the other. Um, and then we see this. And again, different brain regions will light up when you're doing things like, like logic kind of things and, and uh, math problems. However, particularly the left side of the brain will light up a little bit more than the right side. Okay? And similarly, the right side controls muscles on the left side of the body, so opposite. Remember, we have those decussations in the pyramids of the medulla. Um, when we see people appreciating art, music, or thinking about it, or performing it, we'll see the right side light up more. Um, Things like space and pattern perception, like if you're trying to, uh, get, like you're given like a virtual maze or something, um, and then they look to see how your brain is functioning, you'll see more activity in the right side of the brain. Um, that emotional content of language is, again, more right-hand side uh, than the left-hand side. So, you know, like when you curse, there's a lot of emotion behind those curse words, right? It's not just a blasé word. Um, so that emotional content that's put to words is, is again, more in that right hemisphere than the left. Uh, that fusiform gyrus is predominantly in the right hemisphere. And then interestingly enough, if you're given different scents and you're asked to identify them, 
um, again, the right side of the brain lights up a little bit more than the left side. Right. And just a few things about brain waves. You probably have heard of different brain waves. So you have four uh, generic kinds. So there's alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves. So you can kind of see them here. So alpha waves are basically what you would see is if someone, you know, you put one of those caps on their heads um, and, you, you know, the person's just kind of sitting there. They're, they're at rest. They're not you know, asked anything particularly challenging or anything. They're just kind of sitting there. Um, so they're resting, but they're not asleep. You'll see these kinds of alpha waves, right? Um, and then you, you say, give them, I don't know, a math problem, a biology problem. doesn't matter. You just ask them to, to do something mentally active. And you see that the brainwave pattern changes. And you can see it's, it's tighter, it's more clustered, which is what you would expect with greater activity. You would expect greater neuronal firing. Right? Interestingly, when the individual is stressed, like emotionally stressed, like you're anxious or something, um, the brainwaves, again, they get more scattered. Can you kind of see that? You don't have that nice, tight, focused firing of neurons. They're a little bit more over, all over the place. And when you think about that, that kind of makes sense. I mean, when you're stressed out, it's hard to think, right? It's hard to focus on stuff. It's, it's difficult to do well on exams, for example, right? Um, and then you, then you see it, and when you're asleep, you, you totally see very different waves. They're not that jaggy, the sharp peaks, the sharp clusters. They're more, I don't know, they, to me, they look like fluffy clouds of slumber, right? So you get a little bit more activity, less activity. But they're, again, they're, they're not these ch 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 Jagged, they're more like, yeah, active, maybe a dream, no, yeah, no, right? Um, you will also see these delta waves for someone who's had a major traumatic brain injury. And when you see these after a traumatic brain injury, usually the individual, that means that they're not going to come back. You know, they're either going to stay in a coma um, or they're in, they're in a vegetative, they're in a persistent vegetative state, right? There's really not much thought process going on there. Um, and sometimes it's even less than delta. But if the person, person, um, yeah, you, you don't want to see this unless the person's asleep. Okay. All right. So that's the end of this lecture series on the brain. Um, hopefully these have all made sense to you. Uh, as always, you know, please feel free to email me any kind of questions that you may have. Uh, there is a quiz uh, at the end of this uh, series. Uh, take that. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Okay. See you next time.